So hello, take two on starting today's class, take one and how of mic issues. Uh, We're going to continue chapter 10 today. Uh, chapter, sorry, that's a lie. We're continuing chapter 11 today, the penultimate chapter. Uh, so far, we talked about how temperature can change the size of solids and liquids with length elongation like they also volume and area. And we talked a little bit about moles because you got to deal with moles and meh, moles. I hate moles. Um, before we get into it, though, I do want to talk about the final, your final exam. We now have a schedule for it. Yay. Um, I've already sent an email with all this information, but I want to put in the notes to make sure people see it. Um, our final is Monday, May 10th from 3 to 5. I, it's actually from 3 to 5.15 is what I'm leaving it open for because I'm giving an extra 15 minutes to upload it. I have written the exam. I have taken the exam. I think it should be good time-wise. Um, this says we'll upload last semester's exam soon. That is not true. Last semester's exam has already been uploaded, so you can go and see what was last semester. And I do plan on going over it. It will not be in lecture. It will be outside class, but I did a when is good. Hopefully you saw that yesterday. And I will work out when I'm going to do review. If you can't make when I do review, it will be recorded. It will be posted to YouTube with a link on Banco Hall. Um, yeah. Both of my exams that I'm giving on Monday, I hope to have the grades up by Tuesday, but because I have two exams on the same day, I might not get the grades up till um, Wednesday. We'll see. Any questions on that stuff? Okay. That works better now that you can heal me. Let's keep going. There's a lot of technical issues this chapter. Last time the internet kicked out, this time I just can't get my audio working. Awesome. So we're going to talk about how temperature affects gases. And as I said last time, it's a bit more complicated with gases than solids and liquids, because there's a lot of ways to affect the size of gases. That being said, because gases are complicated, we are only going to talk about an ideal gas. You see, an ideal gas is something that always behaves in a constant, predictable manner. And most gases can be treated like an ideal gas. However, if you have very low temperatures, and we're talking like single digit Kelvin, or very high pressures, and we're talking like we are being crushed with the force of a thousand suns, it all breaks down. But for random temperatures and pressures that we like live in and deal with, we can treat any gas as an ideal gas. And for an ideal gas, we can have one equation to explain how the temperature acts with various properties. Now, for solids and liquids, we just talked about how the temperature affects the volume, the size. We were started with length, but the size. With gases, there's something else we're going to have to deal with. We're also going to have to deal with the pressure, because a gas can be, we can increase the pressure of a gas. We can, you know, if you put air in your tires, you're squeezing it and upping the pressure. And so if we want to talk about how temperature affects volume, we have to include pressure. And this will lead to what is called the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is one equation to explain how pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of molecules relate to each other. It is written as so. The ideal gas law says the pressure of a gas, which is in Pascal's, times the volume of a gas, which is in meters cubed, is the number of atoms of gas, or number of molecules if it's a multi-atomic gas, times a constant known as Boltzmann's constant. Boltzmann's constant is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin times the temperature in Kelvin. That is the ideal gas law. It's not just going to be how temperature affects volume, but it's how temperature affects volume and pressure and number of molecules, though we're not going to get into that one too much. Now, some of you might have seen this in a different form before. Some of you might be familiar with PV equals NRT or PIVNOT, as it is so called. Um, the short version is chemistry uses stupid units. Chemists use PV equals NRT because they measure their pressure in ATM, their volume in liters, and is number of moles. But ATM is kind of weird because it's a relative saying how everything is versus air versus a very systematic unit going to the science behind it. Liters are well, just who cares about liters. And moles are just dumb, in my opinion. So we are going to use PV equals NKT in this class. In this class, use only this guy because I will be giving units to match that one. Like all the way back in lab one where we did this. Yes, I'm gonna play with a balloon all class. Questions? Okay. Now, I got a shit ton of videos to show this law in action. 
where I can show how changing each thing affects it. Um, done in class means in the video. The first one is that pressure causes a change in volume. Pressure volume, this one. What I have here is some balloons. And I am putting these balloons in a vacuum chamber. Now, I am not changing the temperature. I am not changing N. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the pressure. And if NKT is not changing, if pressure goes down, volume must go up. And hopefully we'll see that. You know what? Let me put on the audio today. Because it's going to be important for some later things. And so what you can see is as the pressure goes down, these balloons are growing. Their volume is going up. This is just because of the ideal gas law. I'm not changing T. I'm not changing N. When pressure goes down, volume goes up. Yeah, I get a pretty big volume, right? Like, I'm getting a hell of a lot bigger as the pressure goes down. If I remove the pressure back to what the pressure used to be, aka I bring the pressure back up, if I bring the pressure back up, I'm on me, the volume goes back down. That's the idea here. We can also talk about how temperature changes volume. This one I'm going to do a video of that I didn't make. What I have, or these people have, is a bunch of balloon animals and a vat of liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is at 77 Kelvin. So these balloons are at room temperature, which is about 300 Kelvin, and they're going to be brought down to 77 Kelvin to ridiculous music. Well, the music hasn't started yet, but there will be ridiculous music. What you're seeing here is the temperature is going down. Because the temperature is going down, the volume is going down. We're able to fit all these in here because we're shrinking them. Now, if we take them out, the temperature will go back up. If the temperature goes back up, the volume will go back up. That's the general idea, the direct relationship between temperature and volume. And the last one is that temperature can cause a change in pressure. Um, what I'm going to do to show this one is I have a can. This can is open to the air. Because it's open to the air, the pressure in the can is the same as the pressure in the air. What I'm going to do is I heated it up. So it's really, really hot in here. About 500 degrees Celsius is what this hot plate is set to. I'm then going to invert the can into this bucket of ice water. What that does by inverting is it kind of seals the top. And when I seal the top, once again, pressure will be the same as the air pressure, I'm going to decrease the temperature rapidly. If I decrease the temperature, I should decrease the pressure. If I decrease the pressure inside the can, it crushes itself. It actually sucks water up into it. And the can is now crushed because I decrease the temperature, which decreases the pressure. OK? To give you another demo of this, because I can just keep demoing this up. If you remember from chapter nine, we said the height of the liquid is the same at all, that the pressure as a function of depth is always the same. That's why the liquids are the same depth. And we talked about the manometer, where if I add pressure to one side, the liquid becomes uneven. This video is a liquid that's very, very sensitive, or its vapor is very, very sensitive to pressure. This is solid glass. I'm not squeezing anything. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab onto this side. 
by grabbing onto the right side, I'm going to increase the temperature of this bulb. When I increase the temperature of this bulb, that will increase the pressure. And by increasing the temperature, I can make all the liquid go to the other side. I didn't squeeze it. It's just by increasing the temperature, I increase the pressure, pushing the liquid to the other side. OK? And one last video. This one is near and dear to my heart because it A, gave me a skull, and B, got the cops called on me. So you know it's a winner. Um, this was taken by my, me and my friends at SUNY Buffalo. The first few clips were trial runs, which I'll come back to. Um, the, sec the later one was an open house, which was the trial runs for the open house. What we did is we took a soda bottle, and we put a small amount of liquid nitrogen in the bottle, which is nitrogen at 77 Kelvin, and we sealed it tight. We then went and put a, a, a garbage bucket over the bottle. Side note, not a mop bucket. The mop bucket exploded. That's what the skull is from. But we put a garbage bucket over the bottle. What happened is the liquid nitrogen boiled, become gaseous nitrogen at 77 Kelvin. But the air temperature is about 290, 300 Kelvin. What's going to happen is this gaseous nitrogen at 77 Kelvin is going to heat up. And it's going to get harder and harder, closer to that 300 Kelvin. Now, the volume can't change. But as the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up. Oh, I don't think I stated this enough. You know that I keep working in Kelvin? Always make sure you work in Kelvin in the ideal gas law. I don't know if I stressed that enough. You cannot work in Celsius in ideal gas law. It must be in Kelvin. But what happened is the temperature went up, increased the pressure. And eventually, the pressure got so much the bottle couldn't handle it. And the bottle explodes. When the bottle explodes, there's a bucket over it. So as the bottle explodes, it then increases in volume. When it increases in volume, it decreases in pressure. But it doesn't decrease in pressure enough so that the bucket can go boo and shoot upwards. Now, fun fact, it takes about 15 minutes for this thing to go. The video is not that long, which is just enough time to no longer be paying attention. Also, when it blows up, it makes a loud bang noise, which one one professor thought sounded like a gun being shot. That's how we got the cops called on us, although it was all fine once we explained. Uh, and you also you can see the mop bucket in this video. Uh, and later on in the video, when you see people and it's shooting up past them, just so you know, because it's in a stairwell, they're on the second story. They're one story up. There's the mop bucket. Well, we're not going to go up five stories. Okay, yeah, you can <laughs> All that is is the ideal gas law in action. Any questions? Cool. Let's do an example problem. So a pressure cooker, how it works is it greatly increases the pressure inside, affecting cooking times. A sealed pressure cooker has a volume of 5.68 times 10 to negative third meters squared. So I, don't, I just found a pressure cooker off Amazon and took all the data from that. Let's say one is closed at room temperature, which is 20 degrees Celsius, and atmospheric pressure, which is 1.01 times 10 to the fifth pascals. How many air molecules are in the cooker? And part B, if the pressure cooker is sealed and heated until the temperature is 121 degrees Celsius, what's the new pressure? So I'm going to use a lot of initial final in this case because my it's kind of before we turn it on, after we turn it on. So we'll say it started with a pressure of 1.01 times 10 to the fifth pascals and a volume of 5.68 times 10 to negative third meters cubed and a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. However, your temperature must always be in Kelvin. 20 degrees Celsius are well and good, but I must convert this to Kelvin. I do that by adding 293. And I can say the ideal gas law states PV equals NKT. Well, K is Boltzmann's constant. This will allow me to solve for how many air molecules. If I want to solve for any how many air molecules, I'll just divide both sides by KT. 
with that, I can just plug in my numbers and solve. Questions? Pope B says the pressure cooker is sealed and turned on. Temperature reaches 121. What's the pressure? Well, what I'm going to say is we have a new temperature. 101 degrees Celsius is 394 Kelvin. And now I'll solve for pressure. If I want to solve for pressure, I'll divide both sides by the volume and say that the pressure is NKT over V. The, vo the number of particles is sealed. It doesn't change. The volume, it's a hunk of metal doesn't change. So I'll just plug in my the number of particles I found. Boltzmann's constant never changes. Although I put different units here for Boltzmann's constant. That's it. Uh, joule per Kelvin is the same as all this. I don't know why I put it in that format. Uh, a temperature in Kelvin and the volume. Sorry, I'm missing a unit there too. I'm going to have to fix this. Uh, sorry, that this 1.42 times 10 23rd should have been the, uh, oh no, I had no view. Yep, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. My volume on the bottom. 1.42 times 10 to the and it had no units. So I'll plug in and I can solve. That's the new pressure. Went up by about a third. Questions? Okay. So. One of the things I didn't do here was didn't explain where the hell the ideal gas law comes from. I'm just like, this is the ideal gas law, guys. It's cool. I could try to derive it. The derivation of it is a little complicated. And actually, at this point, I'm going to go back and derive some other stuff with it, which kind of gets into where it came from. It's going to be a lot of derivation today. I don't expect you to know how I did all these derivations, but I'll try to explain it best I can to make some logic of it. You see, let's say I got this balloon. This balloon is filled with a gas. The gas inside this balloon has a set pressure based off how much how stretched the balloon is, has a set volume, there's the volume, and is at the same temperature as the air in this room, about 70-ish degrees Fahrenheit, whatever that is in Kelvin. Right? Well, what's happening in this is the air molecules in this balloon are flying around. We talked before about how temperature is related to how fast molecules move. The reason this stays out, the reason this balloon is like this and not like, uh, you know, this, is because the air molecules in the balloon are whizzing around. And what happens is they're going to collide with the walls. They're going to follow all Newton's laws, moving a straight line as a force acts on them, and every once in a while hit a wall. What happens is the reason this balloon stays outright is it's because the air molecules are going in and hitting the walls. Every time they hit the wall, that's what gives the balloon its shape. That is pressure. Now, keep in mind, for an ideal gas, gas, gas molecules have no attraction for one another. There's no extra force pulling them towards each other. And when they collide, they won't lose energy. It will be totally elastic. However, a gas has very, very, very small particles in a big area. Actually, for the most part, gas molecules are so small, it is rare for them to collide because they are so small. And so what you'll get is that gas molecules have no attractive force between each other and are so small they never run into each other. And what we'll get is that they'll bounce off the wall, giving everything its pressure. Now. There's a hole in this balloon I just put out of that bag, like a big one. Not that that matters. So I always say this. Keep in mind, pressure is the gases hitting the wall. We know the higher the temperature, the harder they hit the wall. Because think about it. If I have, this is my wall and something's going, eh, it won't be much pressure. But if it's going, hitting it hard, I got to not punch my ring, hitting it hard, it'll be more pressure. Also, the more particles you have, they hit the walls more often. Think of it this way. If you're going to walk back and forth until you bump into something in an empty room, you're going to hit things pretty seldom. If you're going to bump into everything in like a crowded concert hall or something like that, amazing to think that crowds is a thing that could ever exist again since it's been so long since I've been around a more people. You're going to hit one into objects more often. Likewise, let's say we got an object that is just bouncing between the walls. I'm going to use my video screen. And it's just going like this, 
and hits the wall, and then like this, and hits the wall. If I start decreasing the volume and put another wall right here, it's at the same speed, it's going to hit the walls more often because the walls are closer together. So smaller volume, you hit the walls more often. This is why pressure is affected by temperature, number of molecules, and volume. But keeping that in mind, every time a molecule hits off the wall, its momentum will change. We'll change the momentum, which is going to be mv final minus mv initial. But I said in an ideal gas, they're perfectly elastic. Because they're perfectly elastic, their initial velocity will just be negative. Their final velocity it will be the same value in the opposite direction. Let's get into like a Superman problem I did in class that I said was randomly from a different chapter. This was why it was randomly from a different chapter. We're getting into the same topic. What that means, the change in momentum is just going to be mv final minus m negative mv final which is the same as 2 mv final, that every time it hits the wall, its momentum will change by 2 mv final. Now, before I go any further, this gets complicated. For now, let's just work in one dimension. Let's just say instead of the gas going like, wee molecules in all directions, they can only go in a straight line, straight left, straight right, that's it. It's going to make our life easier. And I'm not going to bother with the F for final because it's the only V we have. So I'm just saying we're only moving in the X direction. So change in momentum is 2MVX. Well, if the change in momentum is 2MVX, I can talk about the impulse. You see, impulse is change in momentum. But impulse is also first times time. And if I divide both sides of that time, that means force is change in momentum divided by time. Well, change in momentum, once again, was 2 mvx. Now, let's say this thing they're bouncing in is a long box, like in this picture on the bottom. And I'm going to say this box has a length d. I can talk about how long it takes it to go to one end, bounce, and come back. You see, if it's moving at a constant velocity, I can say that the velocity is going to be the distance it travels, which is going to be 2d, because it's going down one end, then back. And sorry, that d, that v was real bad. So let's make a better v. Over the time it took. Assuming they're moving at a constant velocity, which if it's at a set temperature, they'll be moving at a constant velocity. Spoilers. We arrange it, I can say the time it takes to go from one end to the other will be 2d over v sub x. And I'm going to just take that time. Yeah. Uh, there's my, my mouse disappeared again. Why is my mouse gone? I'm just going to take that time and shove it in over here. When I do that, I get that the force is 2mv over 2dx which can be reduced. It'll be reduced to this, that the force is mv squared over d. Once again, I'm just doing derivations for a while today. Did I lose anybody as of this point? Am I still good? OK. This was only one dimension, though. Really, I should be doing this in x and y and z. Also, this is only one molecule. I solved this for only one molecule. I just said for one, so each molecule will have a change in force. So I have molecule one plus molecule three plus molecule four plus molecule five and so on. Now, M and D, if it's just one gas, M and D will be the same for everything. One gas, one chamber. And I'll have an N number of turns, where N would be the number of molecules. And so what I can do is I can say also say that the average velocity, the average velocity by definition is the, or the, the, the average of the velocity squared is the sum of the velocity squared over n, right? Take the average of five numbers, you add it up, divide by five. If I take an average of n numbers, I add them up, divide by n. And so the average velocity in x squared will be the average velocity in one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus four squared divided by however many I got. So I'm going to take those two equations. And on my one on the right, I'm going to multiply both sides by n. 
And then I'm going to take that and shove it into this guy, giving me this equation right here. Um, I'm going to rearrange a little bit. I'm just going to move the n up a little bit. But this is where I was getting to this point. This was only one dimension. There should be three dimensions. Now, if you use v squared equals vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared, um, we can also assume in random direction x, y, and z should be approximately the same as each other. You could actually derive out this idea right here that vx squared is actually one third of v total squared. I'm kind of glossing over the math on how I did that, but it trust me, it works. What I'm going to say is this vx average squared, I'm going to plug in this term with the third. Are we still good? OK. We know pressure is force over area. Well, the area of this box will be the area of the end, will be d squared. And so the pressure is that volume over d squared. I can reduce this. When it reduces, it becomes this. But d cubed, d cubed length width height, that's a volume. Leaving me with pressure is one third n over v mv squared. But let's think about mv squared. mv squared, we've seen terms like that. Or at least we've seen one half mv squared. If I multiply this by two over two, I can say it's two thirds n over v times one half mv squared. That one half mv squared, that's what we called kinetic energy. And if I multiply both sides by V, that means PV equals two thirds NKE. The ideal gas law said PV equals NKT. So I'm going to say PV equals NKT, which equals two thirds N times kinetic energy. And if I divide both sides by N, I get this. And if I multiply both sides by three halves, I get that. And this was my goal. What this says is if you have a gas, the kinetic energy of the gas, the internal kinetic energy, aka the energy related to how fast the molecules are moving, is 3 halves kT, where k is Boltzmann's constant and T is the temperature in Kelvin. This says that the kinetic energy of molecules of a gas is directly related to the temperature, and only the temperature. And since the kinetic energy is one half mv squared, this gets into how temperature is a way to talk about the velocity of the molecules. You can see it now because it's written out that one half mv squared equals three halves kT. But when you have gas at any temperature, you know the kinetic energy of the molecules inside if you just know the temperature of the gas. Now, this is the energy of one gas molecule and one average gas molecule. Some might be going a little faster, some might be going a little slower, but on average, their kinetic energy will be three halves kT. Now, if you have a monoatomic gas, aka it's just only one type of thing, kinetic energy is the only energy you would have. And this three halves kT is the energy of each molecule. If you have multiple molecules, you can say the total energy, which would be called actually the total internal energy, which uses the symbol U to represent it, will just be the energy of one molecule times how many molecules you got. And so the internal energy of a gas symbolized by U will be three halves NKT. N, the number of molecules you got times the energy of one molecule. That is how much energy molecules of gas will have. Okay. This can also be worked, used to figure out how fast molecules are moving. Because if one half mv squared equals three halves kT, if I multiply both sides by two, divide both sides by m and square root, I can get the velocity of molecules of gas. That the velocity of molecules of gas of gas would just be the square root of three kT over m. Okay. 
Let's do an example problem. Let's say I got a cylinder. It has two moles of helium gas. It's at 20 degrees Celsius. Find the total internal energy of the system, and what's the velocity of a helium atom? It said two moles of gas. We never work in moles. If I give you anything in moles, you're going to need to convert it, though I didn't do that yet. Also, I said the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. If I give you a temperature in Celsius, you're going to need to convert it. 20 Celsius is 293 Kelvin. There's Boltzmann's constant. The N in 3 halves NKT is not number of moles. It is number of molecules. If I want to know the number of molecules, the number of molecules would just be the number of moles times Avogadro's number. So if I have two moles, it's 2 times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So that's Avogadro's number. Two moles is 12.04 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Therefore, the total internal energy of the system will be 3 halves times the number of atoms times Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. And there you go. Questions so far? If you want the volume, sorry, velocity, velocity is square root of 3 kT over m. I'll just plug in those values and get a value. Questions? OK, we're 20 minutes early. But um, I'm used to getting a lot more questions during this class, which takes a lot longer. But no one asked questions and made it go fast. I really do plan for you guys that time for you guys asking questions. So I guess we're just going to end early today. Um, if you have questions later on, feel free to email me. Um, yeah, there you go. Friday, we'll do practice problems. And uh, Monday, we'll start the last chapter. Have a good day.